UN Women estimate that the exclusion of women from the digital sphere has cost low and middle income countries up to $1 trillion in potential GDP. UPU research has shown us how post can foster the development of their communities by reaching the underserved with essential services. As a key social partner and trusted public service provider, we, the post, can use its global reach to advance digital inclusion and close the digital gender gap. For example, we have studied postal banking and we have provided that it is more inclusive for women than the traditional banking service. Posts therefore have the ability to connect more women with digital financial services. We have seen many examples of gender inclusive innovations in posts around the world. Many posts have delivered target to study and career program for women and girls. They have also supported program for women-led startups and small businesses and have launched investment uh, generating project. I believe some of these examples will be discussed and introduced today. To support these efforts, the UPU and its member countries have been working together to provide capacity building programs in postal digital services, e-commerce, and e-government. Last year, the UPU pledged the connect every post office in the world to the internet by 2030 through, his, through its connect.post project. I encourage, I encourage all of you to build on this expertise to ensure that no woman or girl is left behind as economy grows and move deeper into the digital space. The UN Sustainable Development Agenda has been concern, conceived as an interconnected and comprehensive set of goals. The relationship between successful digitalization and gender equality is one of the brighter examples of these synergies. I hope this discussion will help raise awareness of the immense potentials of the post to advance both of these essential social causes. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Director General, for your opening remarks. And well, we might get stuck in now to introducing our expert panelists who are joining us from, well, around the world is very much a, a global uh, audience today and a global panel. I'll start by introducing our, uh, well, our first speaker, Christine Sund from the ITU. Christine, would you like to just uh, share a few opening remarks? Thank you very much, Ian. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, wherever you may be located connecting to this session. Greetings from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, indeed. So we are a global group here on the panel as well as in the audience, I can imagine. So thank you to UPU Director Metoki and his team for inviting the ITU to celebrate this year's uh, International Women's Day on the theme of innovation and technological change and education in the digital age through this webinar. It's really a great pleasure for us to be present. And those who know me are aware about my passion for connecting schools to the internet as the ITU focal point for the GIGA initiative together with UNICEF and governments across the African continent. And through connecting these schools, connecting people in the communities where the schools are located. 
But how about working together really to connect the people in all communities by connecting all the post offices that still do not have access to the internet. And through this also spur the uptake of digital services. Now, this is something that makes me really, really excited. And just maybe to just uh, take that uh, into context of what we do at the ITU. So ITU is the, really, the UN specialized agency on digital technologies. And we are we have members from 193 governments working together with the private sector and as well as uh, academia. And we're dedicated to connecting the world and to supporting countries in bringing meaningful connectivity and sustainable digital transformation to the citizens in these countries. So here, when we talk about meaningful connectivity, ITU's work on extending meaningful connectivity is grounded on the conviction that bridging the digital divide, encompassing not only bringing access to those people who re remain offline, but ensuring that meaningful connectivity for those who are not currently able to reap the benefits of the digital economy, and more importantly, also, of course, of the digital society. So at the core of digital transformation is the right policies. It's really important that the right policies are put in place, digital policies that also include a gender <laughs> and grounded in gender disaggregated data and research. Gender sensitive policies are a must really to drive inclusive digital transformation. It is moreover critical that governments involve women in the consultative processes and ensure that policy making decisions prioritize their needs. One of the main challenges though that we face is the lack of such informed policies. Let me share some data here at the outset of uh, as I'm introducing myself as well. ITU research shows that by the end of last year only 94 countries had adopted national digital agendas and just a mere 21 of these had a special focus on women and girls. <laughs> and in this and in regard to this, yesterday ITU launched a report uh, on, or a handbook, I should say, on gender mainstreaming. And it really provides a practical tool with some actionable checklists for policymakers to make this happen. And I, I will share also, as we go into the discussion, the link to that, that handbook in the chat that might be of interest to the audience. So just as important as these policies <laughs> are, <laughs> is the need to address all barriers to meaningful connectivity, including the lack of infrastructure, affordability issues, access to devices and skills. They're all really interconnected. And I hope to come back to some of the digital skills projects that we are supporting on the African continent later. So with that, I will end my introduction here and hand back over to you, Ian. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, my goodness. There's, there's a lot to unpack in all of that. I'm, I'm looking forward to our, our deeper discussion later on. We'll be able to tease out some of the details of what you've been talking about there. I'll introduce uh, now Wendy Aitan from the UPU. Wendy, would you like to make a few opening remarks, please? Yes, thank you for giving me the floor. And good after, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm coming to you from Bern, Switzerland. So that's where the UPU is located. I'm really happy to be participating in this event today on innovating equality the post as an engine of digital empowerment. So I'm the director of e-commerce and physical services uh, integration here at the UPU, and I work in the directorate of postal operations. My main role is developing all aspects of mail services, such as letter post, parcel post, and express mail service. I've been working in postal, postal for, postal. for 32 years. The first 22 years were at Israel Post, and I've been at the UPU for 10 years now. When I was preparing for this forum and thinking about the post as an engine of empowerment, I thought to myself that over the 32 years I have worked in the post, I've really gone through a digital evolution. <laughs> that was perfectly placed echo, actually. One of my tasks when I started working in postal operations was international route planning. This details finding the best, cheapest, fastest route for mail from country A to country B. To build the routes, we used this book that looked exactly like the old telephone books. You, you might remember, they were like super, super thick. And some of us uh, may even remember the name, which was the official airline guide or the OAG. This guide contained the airline schedules for all of the airlines. And we had to look up flights for every route, starting with direct flights and then building multiple connections. It took at least a month to build the schedule and we had to do this twice a year. 
So today the OAG is an online database and you can build routes in seconds. Thank heavens for digitalization is all I can say. There were not a lot of women in the postal operations back then. I was lucky that I worked for the only woman vice director in my post. I learned a lot from her about how to thrive in a male dominated environment. At the time, I was aware that women were a small minority of postal operations staff, but I didn't really think twice about it. It was just the way it was. I do remember, though, that sometimes when I had to leave precisely at whatever time it was to run and pick up my four children from school, that eyebrows were raised by some colleagues. And although it was a little uncomfortable at times, it was just the way it was. Because there were very few women in senior positions, and I didn't have many role female role models to look up to over the years as I moved up the hierarchy, I've tried to be a positive female influence and have tried to help other women and men succeed. I think acting as a mentor is a way of giving back and encouraging people to achieve their full potential. It is especially helpful and powerful to help people to find their voice and believe in their abilities. So the position of women in the postal sector may have historically been limited, but there are signs of progress. In general, women have been underrepresented in science, 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 technology, engineering, and mathematics, the so-called STEM fields. However, the postal industry has recognized the need for diversity and inclusion in innovation, and many postal operators have taken steps to increase the representation of women in all roles. Some initiatives include creating mentoring programs and providing leadership opportunities for women in innovation, Companies have also been actively recruiting women in STEM fields and providing training and development programs to help them advance in their careers. Despite these efforts, women still face significant barriers to entry and advancement in digital, digital innovation roles, especially within the postal and logistics sector. There is a need to address systemic barriers such as gender bias and unequal pay, as well as provide resources and support for women in digital innovation roles. Overall, there is progress being made to increase the representation of women in digital innovation within the postal and logistics sector, but there is still much work to be done to ensure that women have equal opportunities to contribute and advance in this field. Now, let me tell you a little bit about why the UPU sees the post as an engine of digital empowerment and inclusion. The UPU supports digitalization, especially in regard to e-commerce, in three major ways. One, the global postal network offers access to postal services and delivers to over 80% of homes around the globe. Two, the UPU network enables financial services in many countries through post offices and payment solution and mobile apps. And three, the UPU offers electronic platforms and tools that support the postal network. So posts can help include women in the market and help women entrepreneurs grow their services by providing a secure platform on which they can sell their products, attractive delivery and return services, payment apps, access to financing, and access to training. To conclude, we in the postal world like to think that the post is the great equalizer. That means providing access to all sectors of society and ensuring that no one has to get left behind in the ever-expanding digital landscape. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. I love that phrase, post is the great equaliser. And that, that idea of how um, we can how we can encourage or support women and girls in technology as well as something we're going to get into in our discussion later on. Now, our next speaker is Vanessa Schochter. Vanessa is from La Poste. Uh, Vanessa, I'll hand it over to you to make a few opening statements, please. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Euh, ravi d'être à vos côtés et d'avoir été invité. Euh, je vous invite à écouter effectivement en anglais pour ceux qui souhaitent la traduction. Euh, je, je représente la Poste française, donc j'interviens depuis Paris. Euh, et à la Poste française, je suis plus particulièrement attachée à la filiale spécialisée numérique, donc DocaPost, euh, qui est la filiale euh, qui est l'expert du traitement des données sensibles, référent de la dématérialisation. En fait, DocaPost fait ce que l'on fait à la Poste dans le milieu physique, le fait dans le milieu numérique. Donc on accompagne la digitalisation avec la lettre électronique recommandée, la dématérialisation des bulletins de paye pour nos clients, le vote électronique, la signature ou les contrats en ligne et l'archivage numérique. 
Euh, donc je représente cette, cette filiale et en fait ce que je voulais vous partager c'est qu'à l'échelle du groupe La Poste nous sommes entraînés euh, dans euh, la progression de la part des femmes à tous les niveaux hiérarchiques euh, et nous a, nous attachons à, à faire progresser cette part des femmes et nous en sommes aujourd'hui au niveau du groupe La Poste à notre cinquième accord signé en 2022 avec les instances représentatives du personnel pour justement favoriser la part des femmes. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on est en plus accompagné par euh, des mesures d'État, notamment la loi Rixin en France, euh, qui veut que l'on fasse progresser dès lors que nous avons plus de 1000 salariés, les femmes en tant que femmes dirigeantes dans l'entreprise et femmes dans les instances décisionnaires, ce qui est très important. C'est que les femmes soient là dans les milieux de décision. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on a des objectifs très ambitieux et pour les femmes, effectivement, nous avons déjà 25% de femmes dirigeantes dans la, à la poste française et 35% dans les instances décisionnaires. Euh, L'objectif étant de tendre, bien sûr, vers les plus de 30%, euh, donc on, nous y sommes quasiment déjà, euh, et puis d'aller vers les 40% à terme. Euh, et ça, nous le, nous le maintenons également dans la filiale numérique. Donc, dès lors que nous sommes dans une filière très scientifique, très technologique, nous avons pu à la poste le faire dans la logistique. Maintenant, nous avons le défi à relever dans la filière numérique. Euh, C'est faire effectivement qu'on ait les mêmes ratios, que l'on euh, qu accueille effectivement des, des jeunes femmes euh, du numérique spécialisé, également en sécurité informatique, en cybersécurité. C'est très important aujourd'hui dans l'IA parce que euh, ce que l'on fait en programmation IA aujourd'hui euh, bah, conditionne euh, le, euh, les services de demain. Et si nous introduisons des biais, nous introduisons effectivement une, des difficultés futures pour les services. Donc nous, nous veillons effectivement à appliquer ces, ces ratios. Euh, et nous sommes impliqués, pas qu'en interne, on se rend compte que pour faire progresser cela, nous avons besoin de nous baser sur des écosystèmes. Faire venir des personnes sur le numérique à la poste, hein, c'est favoriser... Euh, la l'orientation la, vers les filières scientifiques dès le plus jeune âge, des jeunes filles, des jeunes femmes. Donc nous travaillons et nous avons été membres fondateurs de la Fondation française Femmes du Numérique avec 40 autres entreprises françaises euh, pour euh, favoriser des projets visant à orienter et à donner envie à des jeunes filles de rejoindre les filières scientifiques et numériques. C'est très important et depuis trois ans, nous avons accompagné une dizaine de projets associatif pour favoriser l'inclusion des femmes dans la filière numérique et également dans les études supérieures. Parce qu'on sait qu'ensuite, elles arrivent chez nous, elles sont recrutées et plus nous avons des candidates femmes, bah plus nous avons le choix dans les recrutements et plus nous pouvons assurer la parité qui est nécessaire pour nos activités. Donc nous sommes très actifs et ce que je voulais aussi vous partager aujourd'hui, c'est que nos actions ne se limitent pas aux bornes du groupe et des employés internes, des postières, des postiers, mais également à ce que nous faisons avec notre écosystème. En 2019, nous avons décidé d'agir en imposant des quotas. Et nous sommes dit, il n'est plus question d'avoir des startups accompagnées si nous n'avons pas la parité. Donc nous avons décrété cette parité. Et depuis trois ans, nous avons 50% de femmes fondatrices, 50% d'hommes fondateurs. Et je vais vous expliquer aussi aujourd'hui comment nous y sommes arrivés. Mais c'est une question de mobilisation, alors déjà de volonté, de mettre en place des objectifs à atteindre, et puis une question de mobilisation de l'ensemble. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes très fiers d'avoir ces femmes. Mais il y a encore beaucoup d'efforts à faire, parce que ce que je constate aujourd'hui, c'est qu'elles ne sont pas tout le temps entendues, quand elles sont par exemple dans des levées de fonds, dans des négociations de contrats très importants. Et puis, très souvent, auprès, après quelques années, euh, vu que j'ai un historique de 8 ans sur ces startups accompagnées, elles passent les rênes de leur société, elles donnent le, la place de CEO à souvent un associé, un associé homme. Donc, elles abandonnent le milieu des affaires au bout de quelques années. Donc, nous avons encore des efforts à mener sur toute cette partie numérique et c'est ce que je veux vous partager aujourd'hui. Oh. Thank you, Vanessa, for those opening remarks, and we'll try and delve into some of those topics during our <clears throat> during our panel discussion. Uh, our, our final speaker is uh, represents the private sector, so it's great to have a different perspective on this panel. Uh, joining us from Zimbabwe is Rosemary uh, Van Baer, who, um, well, Rose, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Let you um, share a little bit about what you're doing and uh, your perspective on the topics we've been discussing. My name is Rose Rambe and I'm an e-seller from the Zimbabwe uh, Zimpost War. 
So when I came across their brochure then, as they were trying to encourage women in business, especially what we call SMEs, yeah, small business women in, women in business, which are still very small. Then I got interest because as women, we tend to, as African women or as Zimbabwean women, we tend to avoid anything that talks about digital or something that the moment we you hear the word digital, we think of a computer or of a good phone, we start to calculate. But our Zim posts are really working very hard trying to encourage all of us. So as one of the uh, women in business, whom they whom, uh, who approached them actually I approached through their uh, brochure eh, which they were distributing. I'm really happy. I've benefited being on their wall, which they are trying to do for us as SME women in business. And what I've also observed through what they are trying to do, having uh, what we call uh, we used to call them before internet cafes, but they are not doing them as internet cafes, but they are doing boosts where people go in, get trained and what. I've just realized through whatever the Zim posts are trying to do for Zim women and at the same time as African women, us as women, we tend to fear to move ahead, to move with the time, to go uh, like what we call now moving ahead, going with the times. So I would really wish also uh, if our Zim post here, uh, I don't know how they go about it, if they can go to from the grassroots level of women to encourage them to really go digital and use our language. Uh, at the same time, uh, since I started my business, I've grown uh, to design, to dress. Rose Wambe is exhibited in so many places. But because of my background, I say I've achieved a lot because I'm a pure ordinary village girl who grew up thinking of designing ways, become to be SME Businesswoman of the Year eight times in Zimbabwe. I've exhibited as far as Indonesia, Netherlands, representing my country in Africa, I'll say in every other country. So. I would say and encourage uh, Zim, our Zim post to keep on pushing us as ordinary women. I like what they are targeting ordinary women. We are trying to make it in life and tell them to encourage them to be digital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose, because what you've just touched on there is one of the first discussion points that uh, we we're going to launch into really is about how posts can use gender equality to meet those digital transformation goals. Um, I, I think perhaps, uh, Susan, shall we kick off, or would you like to kick off sort of giving an overview of that and maybe we can sort of bring in some of our panellists as we go along here? Um, well, I, I do believe that, that Wendy touched on quite a few um, because in general, um, posts uh, need to, well, everyone, not just posts, but, but all organisations need to have the contributions of everyone involved not just the men who are in the positions of the, the highest levels of power, but everyone of every ability and of both genders so that um, the best ideas can come uh, in order to, to use uh, the ideas that everyone has in order to, to transform digitally uh, from, from, as Wendy says, you know, writing down everything uh, and using paper and, and calculating by hand to actually being able to use computerized services to take care of all of these things that are necessary for the post to operate fully. Um, and uh, I think that uh, that's how gender equality comes into play, not only for posts, but for, for all, uh, all organizations. Wendy, did you want to add something on that? Sure. <laughs> so, um... Following up on what Susan said, um, I, and I, as I mentioned already in, in my opening remarks, the, the POST and the UPU network really provides a, a secure net platform uh, for women or people to sell their products 
uh, attractive delivery and return services, payment apps, access to financing and access to training. So what uh, Rose was telling us about uh, was Zimpost, Zimbabwe Post's initiative in this area. And, and what they did was they, they took all of the elements that also Vanessa was mentioning to, to uh, engage women and empower women. And they made a project around it where they created um, uh, in their post offices it, facilities where women could meet and learn about how to become successful entrepreneurs. They would actually train them and give them the skills they need to be able to open an online shop, um, to be able to uh, figure out how to do the financing. They actually have a, a financing solution as well through the post and providing them also, of course, with the delivery products, the mail products um, that they need to be able to to run an online e-commerce business and have their uh, items ordered and delivered. This is done through a mall that they have created that Rose also mentioned um, that really encourages and engages people, women and uh, other uh, rural people to be able to engage in business and in the market. So it's, a, it's an excellent uh, initiative. And, and you can see from what Rose was saying that now she sells internationally. Um, she, she's on the international arena. Really, I, I mean, I really appreciate what you said, Rose, and, and I applaud you uh, for what you've done. And I'm going to look up your website after this. <laughs> uh, Christine, I might come to you now because you, in your opening remarks, you were talking about meaningful connect connectivity. Um, there's also this other theme of digital transformation and what that means in developing communities. So can you can you share some comments on that with regard to this digital inclusivity and what was that phrase again, the meaningful connectivity and especially what it means for women and girls in those developing communities? Uh, with pleasure, Ian. And I'm actually looking forward to Rose coming to us in Ethiopia as well with her products and and, uh, and maybe one day, Rose, we can also find you here in, in Ethiopia. So then, yes, I just wanted to share some thoughts about the importance of digital skills in this context. Skills really that allow young and old to contribute to and benefit from the digital economy and digital society. And I truly believe that digital skills can change lives. Even basic digital skills training can be a turning point for many women and girls around the world. I support work in sub-Saharan African countries from the IT regional office here in Ethiopia. And I just wanted to share an example from one of our projects. A woman who was who's called Shaka, she took part in our Tech as a Driver of Women's Economic Opportunity Project, which is led by ITU and EIF. EIF is the Enhanced Integrated Framework, and also which feeds into the Equals uh, Initiative, a coalition and global partnership for gender equality in the digital age. Shaka, she comes from a livestock farming family in Burundi and the workshop she attended on e-commerce really opened her eyes to new possibilities. She's now part of a group of more than 800 women across Burundi and Ethiopia, but also Haiti, who has taken part in this project to date, learning new skills, putting their product, produce, handicrafts and designs online and for sale, like, just like Euros in a way, but maybe in a smaller scale, they're, they're still not so, not as international, but they have been able to, 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 to really build some successful businesses and they've been able to explore new markets. And maybe that means that eight, these are 800 lives that have been changed through digital skilling at different levels. But the project I'm referring to also goes beyond skilling up. It also connects women to digital and networking platforms. It helps them to drive economic ad advancements for themselves and through this for their families and uh, in their communities. And we would of course love to have more women, more young, uh, young, young girls as well involved in these kind of trainings and skilling programs. And we have others maybe that I will have an opportunity to mention later as well uh, maybe just to to wrap up here on the on uh, to answer your question there uh, ian uh, we really, really find that project uh, progress towards gender equality is just it's just way too slow there are so many things 
that are happening, but it's just way too slow. We need to continue to work together through some concrete initiatives to enable and empower women to become equal leaders in today's digital transformation. And we are making pro progress, as we can see here in this webinar as well, but we are, well, we are not there yet. So um, my challenge to us here is to see, well, how can we speed it up? How can we work more closely together to make this happen and make these opportunities really become real for more women and girls? With this, I end my intervention here and hand it back over to you, Ian. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christine, for that that um, that in depth answer and with the examples. Very, it's always great to hear examples of what's really happening out there. Uh, Susan and, and Vanessa as well. Do you have anything else you want to add on this particular topic of how posts can find ways to support? women in business, whether it's SMEs and through these different methods like that Rose and um, Christine just mentioned, whether it's access to finance or access to the internet or all those sorts of things. Do you have any other comments you, either of you would like to share? Well, Ian, I think that uh, one thing that's been mentioned by several of our panelists today is education. That's very, very important for women and I'm, I'm sorry, for, for boys as well as girls. Uh, to be able to understand more about the digital world, how they can use digital uh, tools to help them. And, um, you know, I very much applaud the, the ITU program. And uh, Vanessa was also talking about encouraging uh, girls to, to study STEM. Uh, so perhaps, Vanessa, you could elaborate a bit on that. Mm -hmm. Euh, je vais revenir un petit peu sur le programme d'accompagnement des startups que nous avons euh, pour vous dire un petit comment les choses ont basculé. Alors, on est encore loin hein, de, de, de la parité complète, mais ça évolue. Euh, ça évolue quand on change aussi beaucoup de choses, quand on change les codes de communication. Euh, on n'a pas la même façon de communiquer et les gens ne sont pas réceptifs à la même chose. Donc, en fait, quand on est passé de 9% à 50% de femmes entrepreneurs, alors nous, on accompagne des startups qui sont au démarrage. Hein, elles sont en pré-commercialisation, commercialisation d'une solution. Elles démarrent tout juste. Elles sont toutes petites. Elles n'ont elles n'ont pas fait de levée de fonds. Elles sont deux, trois personnes hein, à la tête de l'entreprise. Voilà, c'est tout. Euh, et ces, ces startups ont vraiment besoin d'être accompagnées. Au début, comme je vous le disais, on communiquait sur « nous recherchons des startups » IoT, Internet of Things, euh, la technologie pure hein, euh, rebute un peu les femmes. Euh, donc, on, on a évolué dans le temps euh, et on a vu que pour atteindre la parité, il fallait qu'on parle de la finalité. Donc, c'est « avez-vous un service numérique à impact positif sur la société ?» Quand on dit ça, ça attire beaucoup plus de jeunes filles et de femmes. Elles se disent, mais oui, bien sûr, et comme nous avons quatre thématiques, c'est des services numériques pour la e-santé, pour des services de proximité améliorés, trouver tout autour de chez soi, en logistique, pour faciliter sa vie au quotidien, trouver des services au sein des entreprises pour faciliter euh, la relation avec les clients, faciliter euh, le, au jour le jour euh, les activités dans une entreprise, ou faciliter la partie territoire, c'est-à-dire euh, les services administratifs numériques qui ne sont pas accessibles pour tous, ou l'éducation pour tous, etc. Eh Et bien, quand on donne ces thématiques tous les ans, là, ça parle plus aux femmes. Et c'est pour ça aussi que nous avons beaucoup plus de candidatures. Donc, c'est aussi cela, c'est parler avec une façon différente, c'est l'impact, l'impact sur la société. Et puis, on avait aussi pour habitude au démarrage du programme, de 2015 à 2019, vous savez, on est dans le monde des start-up, à l'échelle mondiale, c'est un mouvement qui est très important. Et on parlait de booster votre business, scaling, passer à l'échelle, la forte hypercroissance, etc. Ça fait peur aussi aux femmes. C'est-à-dire que les femmes ont envie d'un business pérenne, viable, euh, qui crée de la valeur localement, mais pas forcément tout de suite de l'hypercroissance. Vous voyez et en fait, on a changé la façon de communiquer en disant « Non, rejoignez-nous, rejoignez la communauté, discutez avec des pairs, parce que très souvent, il y a la solitude de l'entrepreneur, euh, vous êtes seul. Donc là, vous allez être accompagné, vous allez être formé. On, les apprend, on leur apprend aussi à pitcher correctement, à se mettre en avant, parce que les femmes aussi ont peur de se mettre en avant. Et j'aime l'exemple le, de Rose qui n'hésite pas à aller partout parler de ce qu'elle fait, euh, parce que ça, c'est très important. » 
mais souvent les femmes n'osent pas le faire, donc on, on leur apprend les codes pour effectivement se mettre en avant. Et quand on fait ça, eh bien on sait que ça va être ensuite des entreprises très solides avec lesquelles nous on va pouvoir mener des partenariats en tant que poste. Donc ça c'est deux, deux points impo importants, changer les axes de communication, ne pas faire peur, ensuite accompagner pour que ait, ça s'inscrive dans la durée, et puis je dirais la, la troisième chose, c'est ne jamais oublier, euh, et, et nous on est très très euh, comment dire axé sur ce point-là, euh, et je pense que toutes les postes nous avons ça dans notre ADN, euh, nous sommes dans tous les endroits, la poste passe partout tous les jours, elle est en proximité avec ses clients. Et les startups que nous accompagnons, nous ne voulons surtout pas les déraciner. Elles sont dans telle ou telle région de France et c'est très important pour nous parce qu'elles ont leurs clients, leurs fournisseurs, leur écosystème régional. Et donc c'est ça aussi qui participe, ne pas les déraciner, les laisser là où elles sont, mais les faire briller à une échelle un peu plus importante. Et ça, les postes peuvent le faire. Elles peuvent à la fois faire les liens locaux et mettre en visibilité ces superbes entreprises à une échelle plus large et encore plus largement à l'échelle du PU. Thank you, Vanessa. And remember, everybody, you can keep, you can pop your questions. Just, 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 pop those questions. Quick, 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 quick. The echo comes through our headphones again. You can pop your questions in the Q and A, and we will start getting to them very soon. You can ask in French because Susan's going to translate them. Ellie can ask in English, and I will translate them into Australian for everybody. Um, I, I want to, um, and I, I have a. a Well, Rose, I might ask you a quick question before, I, uh, um, before we move on. One of the things that was just mentioned was about education. And you mentioned when you first spoke earlier about um, the training that you received in whether it was distance selling or whatever it might be. Can you just tell us a bit what, about what it means for you as someone who's a creator, creating fashion, creating a look, whatever, to be able to traverse the online business world and, and how, you know, what, what training or what education you, you needed or what you've observed in your fellow entrepreneurs, what they needed as well. What I observed and what I learned from uh, the digitalization is uh, marketing was a problem. Producing, I was producing, having a small shop at the corner of the street and people were coming in, but the sales then were not like reaching uh, where I really wanted them to. And even the, what you call it, the month end income at the end of the day to do all the bills and so forth. And as we were, uh, as I was being taught, I also realized that what is it that scares us as women in business? I realized everything is in English or it's another in another language. And also uh, what we call it, uh, the format, they use for me to follow up to uh, you know to fill up all the spaces required they are also in english it scares women away if there could be uh, these programs in uh, local languages and also what i observed is i'm growing in it uh, other women they are just uh, not interested in investing in a laptop. They calculate. Most women are very calculative. A standard laptop here costs about $600. So a woman will say, what will $600 do with me? So I was actually going to share this with our Zoom post here today as they invited me, that the cost of laptops or the cost of a good phone to do everything on, on online or even to be a member of the Zimbabwe email is uh, not like growing fast as we all require. It's because of the language and the cost of the items of a good phone and a laptop. Thank you. Ian, if I may, Yes. I'd like to uh, further explore the, the differences here between uh, the way men and women approach uh, these issues because, you know, gender equality doesn't mean that we're the same. We need to understand the differences, both, uh, of, you know, how men think as well as how women think. And, um, you know, Wendy and I work together, so we were talking the other day in this connection about mentoring. And I wonder, Wendy, if you would be interested in explaining a bit more about how you see the differences between men and women and the reason why it's very 
uh, important to mentor women. Sorry, uh, just Susan, if, if I may, just before we go on to mentoring, because it's going off and I really would like to just pick up a little bit on what Vanessa, Christine and now Rose have said about um, mainly accessing uh, the internet. I mean, you, you can't be part of digitalization if you don't have access, if you don't have access to the net itself, and if you don't have access to mobile phones and computers. Um, and this is something that our Director General touched on in his opening remarks that uh, the, the through dot post, the UPU, um, all of the postal offices in the world are being, are starting to be connected um, to the internet and they can be used as Zimpost shows as centers where the community can come and actually have access to the to the internet. Now I'm not sure from after hearing Rose if Zimpost for example gives access to computers and to other equipment that might be needed, maybe they do, but if um, if the laptops and mobile devices are expensive in these areas, then maybe that could be another way that the post could help the community by providing, you know, uh, like an internet cafe, as Rose mentioned, or somewhere where the community can come together and have the equipment so they don't have to invest in it and they can use the money to invest more in their own marketing and in their own wares and producing dresses or, or whatever they want. Yeah. So, sorry, I just wanted to make that comment if that was okay. But going back to um, mentoring men and women, I, I think this is my opinion. So <laughs> I, I think that men and women look at things sometimes from, from have a little bit of a different perspective on things. I mean, we're socialized uh, differently um, in growing up, or at least we were. I think it's changing now. I, I can see with my children, my youngest is 27, my oldest is 35, and I can see how they work with their in their relationships with their wives. It's much more equal than it was than I was young, for, for example. Um, but so so I, I think that if you if we want to mentor uh, either men or women, we, we, we have to come at it from a little bit of a different aspect. I, I think as I think it was Vanessa that mentioned before, women aren't so easily talking about themselves. It, it's, it's, it's a lot of women find it hard to, um, to promote ourselves. And if we do promote ourselves, sometimes it's seen, um, it's taken in a wrong way, like we're, we're too ambitious or, you know, there's other, these other catchphrases that are put on us. So it's important to me as, as, as when, when I'm talking to, um, women or even younger men to, to really understand where their strengths are and how to develop these strengths and how to, to be comfortable in the strengths they have and, and not to be afraid to express themselves um, and say what they're good at and even say what you're not so good at. Not all of us are, are great at everything and I think we have to, to realize that. And one of the um, tools that I usually recommend to do this is to write down what you do, you know, if you do, if you finish a good project, a successful project, write it down. And then when you have to write a CV or when you have to um, come to sit beside with your assessment with your boss, you, you have these things already in front of you. You don't have to start racking your brains like, what did I do this year? You know, it's there in front of you. And even not for those purposes, just to remind yourself of the of the good things you do, of the of, of your contributions, you know, and, and help your, your self-confidence grow in that way. So it's just a little bit about the way I see things there. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Wendy, for that. And just a really, we had a question coming from Rogerio in Mozambique, who's basically asking um, to find out more about projects like the Zimpost project or like the various projects that are either empowering women, empowering women in small business. Um, is there a central place that um, other postal operators can go to to find out more about what other projects are out there so they can learn from that to be inspired to do something in their own country? And Susan or Wendy, if either of you are able to answer that one. I think I, I think I would sorry, I think I would uh, recommend to to just to write an email to either Susan or myself and we can channel it to the proper people inside the uh, the IB in, in the International Bureau and and then we can respond that's all right so there you go um so Rogerio um hopefully you can get in contact with someone at the UPU International Bureau and they'll be able to point you in the right direction um keep popping those questions in the Q&A so we've got a question here it says uh it's aimed at oh gosh I've lost it 
or is it maybe it's been put into French? Oh, here we go. A question to Christine from the ITU, um, from Ariana. Hello, Ariana. Thank you for your question. Um, at the beginning, you were talking about the importance of having specific digital gender policies in place that address issues such as access to digital technologies, infrastructure, etc. Could you please elaborate on this point and perhaps share some good practice if you've got good practice from the ITU to that end and what where they're at now? Great, thank you so much for that question. Uh, and as I had promised, I didn't do it yet, but I'll put that handbook on gender mainstreaming indeed in the chat. It has fresh case studies as well that may be interesting to browse through and may relate to specific things that you're seeing in, in, your, uh, in your specific context. And uh, yes, indeed, I, I did talk, talk quite a lot about the policies, but there is all, I would also like to draw our attention to the critical gaps in data to inform those policies. Because if we don't have the data, the right data for the for the for the for our <laughs> development projects and interventions, it will be very difficult for decision makers to take take action on, on those. So maybe that's just maybe a one thing I, I would like to I would like to put out there. And and just one more note there on. Um, on, on, on the link, that link between policies and data. We need to be able to measure meaningfully this gender digital gap and then mm -hmm. guide those policy interventions. And here also, because we see that there is this gap, and I gave the example of, well, if you look at the new policies and we did a review at the end of last year, there were so few that had specific text on gender inclusion and also in, in this in this respect. What we also see is that there is a lot of lack of inclusion in those same policies for persons with disabilities. So we see that there, that's why we find it's really important to take a snapshot from time to time to identify where work is still required. And, and we call here, and in, in response there to your question uh, still, we do call for closer partnerships and collaboration at the national level, regional and international level, to invest in tools and techniques for gathering such data. So looking forward there to working very closely with UPU and the postal system as well and see well where can we find where our data can complement one another. So I, I hope that answers the question but happy to uh, further elaborate as well as needed. Thank you. Thank you for that, Christine. And please, everybody, keep popping your questions in the Q and A. Um, the comments as well that are going in there. We, we've had an interesting uh, sort of half question, half comment um, on the role of privacy um, when it comes to digital empowerment, inclusion, and things like that. Um, do does any of the panelists have a comment on um, on privacy or and whether that's an issue when it comes to um digital empowerment or any of these sorts of things anybody want to comment on that no well um you know i think that uh privacy obviously is critical um and data protection is critical and uh through the dot post platform the upu can offer that to to uh posts that are interested in setting up platforms um you know other than that it is a matter of, of national legislation. And the dot post initiative is a very interesting one. Um, and who's, is it still pulled on? Who's the right, right person for people to contact at the UPU? If you want to find out more about the dot post and how your postal operator could be part of that and its role in, it's the right phrase, I suppose, trustworthiness of the internet. Would that be the right way of putting it, Susan? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh huh. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe yes. I can also add to that Please question and, and to what Susan was saying there as well of the initiatives that UPU is, is undertaking. For those who have children at home, there is the Child Online Protection Initiative and uh, where are guidelines to parents, to educators, and really to talk about safety online at home. So there's, of course, a big responsibility there with, with us as, 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 as parents as well, but also, I mean, for us to share with, uh, with our families more broadly so that young people are made aware of, of, of how you stay safe online and you don't have to be scared uh, and what, how you should do what you shouldn't do and so forth. So we will also pop into the chat maybe uh, the, the link to where those guidelines and there's a lot of really child-friendly material there as well that can be used very widely in many different languages. Thank you very much for that, uh, Christine. Um, so please do everybody keep those questions coming in because 
I'm doing my best to feed them to the um, to the panelists. Um, um, Susan, were there any questions that have come through in French that you wish to relay to one of the panelists? Yeah, not so far, Ian. Not so far. All right. I mean, there are a um, few that are in French, but they are simply translations of of what you and I have prepared to ask. In any case, <laughs> I see. <laughs> Um, well, um, Christine, you're very popular in the Q and A. I've got another question that's come in for you. Um, I don't. Um, it's uh, it says so first of all, it says I'm sorry that I'm a man rather than a lady. And there's no need to apologise, everybody. Uh, but the question goes to the ITU regarding capacity building to the LDCs in the postal sector. Um, how can you assist those who are still struggling and getting quality training for po for women in the postal sector? Um, and I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the last bit of it, but um, Christine, are you able to, do you have access to the Q&A there, Christine? Can you see the questions coming from Andrea Rogaziano? Let me see if I can see the question from Andrea. Yes. I'm not seeing, let me just go on the other one. I think she's saying that there are uh, many people in South Sudan who have no access to this particular uh, this, this webinar, and I, I suppose that means because of, of lack of access, you know, digital access. So how can the UPU and ITU assist uh, in digital access? So, uh, I mean, thank you very much for that clarification. So there's the access component, and then there's also, which would be in our terminology, the connectivity, you know, bringing connectivity there. And then, I mean, there's the challenge that Rose mentioned also the, uh, the cost of devices once you have that. And then there is how you use it, the skills that I talked about earlier. So, I mean, I, when we talk about uh, women afford, not being able to afford devices or not having access to that wonderful 3G or 4G network that is just kind of up, out there above us, uh, you know, which is the case for most women in these developing countries, to be honest. How can we then expect these women to know how to use that technology? So I think there are a lot of initiatives out there. We see that there is a lot of duplication because we do not of, of creating the uh, the same training content, but not building on. Instead of saying, "Well, we're we're doing digital skills training, basic, you know, what what you need to know to perhaps use." The internet on your phone and so forth but the application of that like basic digital skills for for those who work in the agriculture field or those who are you know uh, having other domains but there is very little of that so that's what we are really trying to to bring those who have in the context of ethiopia i can speak as one example but there are initiatives also in other countries where we i mean as un agencies and development partners together with the national stakeholders we come together we share well what content do we have available what content can be translated to the local context are localized but also with the languages across the country and then we see also where there are gaps seeing well no one has yet developed any material on this what what if we work together to develop that and then make sure that we distribute it through our channels so that's really where what, what Aplia would put out there again let's work together let's look at the local needs and then see what we can do to make make this happen for more people thank you uh, uh, go ahead wendy please just from the UPU side, um, the UPU has various pro uh, projects to help the developing countries um, in the in the postal air in the postal arena. So, for example, one of our we have the quality of service fund, um, which the developing countries have access to to help them. Um, with technology regarding letter posts, et cetera, either technology, learning, you know, whichever, they, they just have to basically put forward a project that would help them with their infrastructure for, for the mail. And uh, they have a, a, you know, they can get it approved. Also, the, the UPU over the years has put out, uh, has in initiated some uh, programs, especially in Africa, to try and, and engage the governments, the private sector and the postal sector to encourage e-commerce. And this was, this was um, also using training and education. And one of the key issues was to the, that the, the, the government of the country participating had to commit to putting in policies that were favorable uh, for developing, obviously, the internet, the access to the internet, uh, the keeping the cost low, and engaging women and other minorities in into the project. So there are uh, ways that 
we can help. And another one, I just keep going back to this, is that um, um, using the post offices as a center uh, for accessing the internet as well. So um, there are programs available also at the UPU. Thank you for that, Wendy. Now, I'm going to have a quick look through the Q&A and see if we've got something else in here. Um, we have had a question come through um, from Pakistan regarding um, gender parity. And I know we've talked a lot about sort of um, access and also the, the also within the post, there's the issue of gender parity. Um, Wendy and Susan spoke about mentoring before, and that's sort of part, part of sort of trying to redress the imbalance. Would that be the right word? When it comes to gender parity, um, how can posts effectively in this? How can we transform posts? This is a question from Aisha. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, how can we transform the posts effectively in this emergingly emerging digitally innovative world? And are there any specific UPU projects that women from from Pakistan or even from other parts of the world can participate in to learn how, how to emerge as leaders who can help elevate their own post to be on a par with those in the developing world? Uh, Susan or Wendy, are you able to uh, provide some comments on that? Susan, am I taking that? <laughs> okay. So I, I think, again, there's a lot of ways that um, the Post can support women uh, and girls and, you know, to succeed in technology. And, you know, we can encourage diversity and inclusivity in, inclusivity in our policies, in the, postal, in the policies inside the postal administrations, inside the national governments, inside the UPU. The, uh, our Director General uh, spoke about that a little bit earlier, and our Deputy Director General did a very interesting podcast yesterday on that for Women's Day. If you're interested, you can also look that up. That's available on the web. We can also promote education and training. I forgot to mention in my uh, previous answer that the UPU has a training program called Train Post, and it's all online. And it's for it has basically every pretty much every operational topic uh, that is necessary to work in the post. And people can access it from from the postal administrations can access it and learn at their own own speed. So I, I think that helps a lot. We can uh, host events and conferences like this one, engaging women, engaging uh, the whole sector in, into these kinds of discussion, raising uh, sensitivity. Uh, women, I, I think the situation won't change unless women are more visible and women are actually at the table helping make policy, uh, you know, being part of the decision making. And we see that changing. I think Vanessa made a lot of points about that when she was saying what was going on in her administration. So, so that was really good. We can also highlight successful women in post in, 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 that are working in the post and, you know, see how they move forward, not only in the post, in ITU, for example, um, and, and see how they move forward. So we can, first of all, to show it's possible and also to uh, benchmark on how it was done, for example. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that I, I think that we could take up. Thanks, Wendy. I'm sorry. I was uh, looking at a question that came in in French, and I was uh, uh, looking at it so that I could uh, interpret it or translate it for Vanessa. It's it's uh, directed at you, and it says, "How does Vanessa manage to recruit women, and are you able to monitor the progress of their various activities? And if so, how you can do that?" Hello. Sur le recrutement, il y a le recrutement pour pour devenir postier, postière, et là on change la façon pareil de communiquer. Quand on décrit un poste, il y a les compétences techniques, mais beaucoup les compétences comportementales et aussi le l'environnement de travail qui va être très important. Vous arrivez dans quel environnement de travail Parce que ça compte beaucoup aussi pour les femmes. Donc on, on parle beaucoup de, de cela. Euh, et euh, je rejoins ce que Wendy et Christine ont partagé. Euh, on a mis en place euh, des, des webinaires internes euh, où on fait intervenir une fois par mois. C'est notre directrice parité qui l'a mis en place. Ça s'appelle les Mercredis Parité. Et une fois par mois euh, intervient une femme euh, du numérique euh, qui n'est pas forcément une scientifique à la base. Ça peut être une femme qui vient plutôt du commerce, qui vient d'autres filières, 
mais qui exerce des métiers euh, aujourd'hui numériques à la poste. Et généralement, on fait intervenir cette femme avec une autre femme invitée de l'extérieur. Et c'est souvent un échange, un débat, et c'est pour montrer aux autres euh, postières dans, dans l'entreprise que c'est possible. Donc ça, ce sont les initiatives importantes. On accueille aussi très régulièrement les, les, les jeunes filles qui sont au collège, en troisième, qui doivent faire des stages en entreprise. Et on leur ouvre les portes de l'entreprise pour qu'elles viennent voir. Euh, qu'elles viennent voir comment cela se passe et que les métiers du numérique, ce n'est pas euh, uniquement euh, des jeunes hommes avec des suites et capuches devant leur ordinateur, avec euh, les grands casques et à faire du gaming toute la journée. Voilà. C'est montrer effectivement comment ça se passe. L'environnement de travail est très important pour le recrutement. Et après, effectivement, les suivre dans le temps, je vous rejoins. Le mentoring est très important, voire même le cross-mentoring. Je trouve qu'on a toujours à apporter aux autres et les autres nous apportent beaucoup. Et euh, il y a des programmes de leadership au féminin que l'on fait, ça peut être... Euh, entre nous en interne, mais ça peut être aussi avec justement une petite entreprise, une start-up. Hein, on va la mentorer pendant une demi-journée et on apprend beaucoup à faire ça parce qu'en en fait, ça participe aussi à des jeunes femmes qui participent à ces programmes, des postières, de se mettre en situation, euh, de donner des conseils. Donc, euh, ça, ça leur permet d'exercer leur leadership. Donc, je pense aussi que ça, c'est très important, le, le mentoring euh, et encourager à ça. Et euh, on essaye bien sûr de, de mettre les, les hommes, dans. et je pense qu'il faut aussi en parler. On, on parle de parité aujourd'hui, et je pense qu'il ne faut pas s'adresser qu'aux femmes. En fait, c'est un sujet collectif, et donc souvent quand on parle de leadership au féminin, dans ces programmes, nous incluons des hommes, parce que c'est eux qui vont pouvoir en parler, c'est eux qui vont pouvoir se rendre compte qu'effectivement, quand on est en minorité, c'est plus difficile de s'exprimer, c'est plus difficile d'être entendu. Euh, donc voilà, je, je voulais aussi vous dire que le mentoring et les programmes de leadership euh, au féminin, on les ouvre, on les ouvre également aux hommes. Et je vais vous donner une anecdote. Euh, une année, on a réuni des, nos start-up où c'était la première année où on avait la moitié de fondatrices, la moitié de fondateurs. Et en fait, euh, c'était des équipes euh, dans leur dans leur petite start-up, ils étaient très monolithiques. C'était que des hommes ou que des femmes, vous voyez et le fait de les avoir mis ensemble dans des sessions de travail pour travailler leur modèle économique, pour travailler leur développement, euh, ils ont commencé à apprendre à fonctionner, se, rend, se sont rendus compte qu'il y avait une énorme richesse à partager ensemble avec des points de vue très différents. Et quelques mois plus tard, et je réponds à cette question sur comment on les suit, Beaucoup nous ont rappelé euh, en nous disant, bah, on est en train de vous indiquer que ça y est, nous progressons, nous avons grandi, nous recrutons. Et nous avons changé nos modes de recrutement. On va, par exemple, recruter beaucoup plus de femmes. Et des femmes arrivent dans la structure. Alors que c'était uniquement une équipe de, de trois, trois amis, hommes, qui se connaissaient au démarrage voyer. Et on les suit comme ça pour voir comment les équipes évoluent dans le temps. Donc, euh, voilà, plusieurs actions, effectivement, à mener. Euh, et il faut agir euh, un peu partout. Et je pense qu'il y a quelque chose aussi à, à, à prendre en compte, c'est... Euh, Chacun, enfin, l'empowerment, je pense qu'il n'y a pas de mot euh, meilleur en français, je préfère le mot en anglais, l'empowerment est très important, il faut que chaque femme, justement, euh, bah, soit en charge et euh, prenne cet empowerment. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Susan, there's a question. <laughs> We'll try that again. Susan, there's a question uh, for Rose in the chat. And if Google Translate hasn't misled me, I think it's a question about the ongoing support that or ongoing training that the post might offer uh, women entrepreneurs. So um, I'll get told if I've got it wrong, but uh, Rose, can you just share a little bit about that, whether there is any on or whether there is, and if so, what form it takes, any ongoing support you get from the post Because obviously, if, you've, if you're starting a startup, that's different to when you're in a mid-stage of your business. So tell us a bit about that, please. Okay, what I would like to say is uh, the effort has been done. And the, what is actually lacking for all the women to, is to, the loans to equip themselves so that everyone can access uh, the digital thing well, that we are all going talking about right now. Because if women could uh, uh, access loans, uh, everyone, every other woman, 
would equip themselves and they all go digital and market themselves and the businesses will grow. That's what I can say. There we go. Finance has come up again. Um, thank you very much for that, Rose. Um, Susan, do you have any, are there any other questions that have come through on the chat that have caught your eye um, that we should well, um, put to the panelists? Yeah, there's one that I really like uh, because I used to be involved in regulatory affairs before I moved to sustainability. And uh, from a regulator, we said we have a question asking which programs uh, can regulators be a part of or uh, what can be recommended to regulators so that they can, can, can contribute uh, to the gender and digital transformation. Um, I, I uh, really like that question. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that regulators want to be involved. Um, what we are seeing right now in the regulatory field is that it's very, very important for different fields of regulation to be understood together. For instance, we have ITU here today because telecommunications and internet and post are all interrelated um, in terms of uh, being able to, to raise uh, gender equality that often comes from, from the employment side of regulation or, or ministry. And um, it's just, it's very important to, to communicate together with other, um, other areas of regulation and, and be able to, to, uh, to, uh, to make sure that, that they go hand in hand and that there are no obstacles and regulators can always you know, do their best to jump in and try to make things uh, more um, uh, accessible for the posts if the posts want to want to help and want to um, want to uh, provide programs. And I see Vanessa nodding her head. I wonder if she has uh, any anything to add to that. Je, je confirme, c'est quand on a obligation de faire que l'on trouve des trésors euh, d'ingéniosité et euh, que, que l'on innove. Et euh, quand au niveau de, de la loi, euh, et là je parle pour la France, arrive la loi sur euh, le pourcentage de femmes dirigeantes à avoir dans les entreprises, euh, quand nous-mêmes on s'applique quelque chose qui n'est pas de la loi, mais on s'est appliqué le quota sur les start-up, etc., Quand on s'oblige à regarder ça, on va même un peu plus loin maintenant. On regarde aussi, vous savez, les mixer les générations aussi. C'est mixer les seniors, les plus jeunes dans l'entreprise, etc. C'est tous les points de vue qui sont importants. Mixer les diplômes. Il y a des gens qui sont non diplômés, plus diplômés, etc. Et c'est ça qui fait toute la richesse. Donc quand on, on a une loi qui s'impose, une réglementation et qu'on la suit, là on va trouver justement les ressources et on va trouver des solutions. Et, et je pense qu'on a besoin aussi de cela. On ne pourrait pas, nous, avoir la parité si on n'avait pas des actions mises en place par le gouvernement aussi pour imposer ça au niveau, des, par exemple, des écoles. S'il n'y a pas des, des, des formes de quotas au niveau des écoles, euh, on, on peut tendre vers 0% de femmes dans les filières scientifiques à terme. Donc, c'est très important, effectivement, qu'il y ait des actions euh, qui soient faites par les écosystèmes et l'État et, et tout, tout l'aspect euh, réglementation est important. Thank you for that, Vanessa. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in from the chat and in the Q&A about what role men play in all of this, whether as a, a gender champion, which is a role that a couple of posts seem to have embraced. But I, I, I suppose perhaps even deeper than that, when uh, Christine, you mentioned in your opening comments about involvement or involvement of of uh of women in policy making and in consultative processes um what what does that actually mean in general and what does that mean what could that mean for our postal and telecommunications sector thank you thank you very much uh, ian i think it can mean uh, different things i think we need to be vocal about things that are going well, vocal about what our aspirations are. And I think Vanessa talked about that as well. Having uh, clear statements of where we are hoping to go and then what, and then uh, having countries then translate, well, what does that mean to us? 
but also within our own organizations, and I can speak to, to ITU, I mean, uh, having role models and champions also within the organization is very important. Having uh, leadership, we recently have our first uh, female secretary general, that is a role model and that it's possible to aspire towards such a role, even in a very technical domain. But also when we look at our, in, in, within our technical, well, let's say, study groups and other decision-making organs, that there are women there at in those posts leading big conferences where, where, where guidance for the rest of the world is being created. That it's really like you're seeing the 50-50 there or you're aspiring to 50-50 and you're taking measures every year to improve on that. So that's really what I would like to say, you know, we need to not just do the talking, but also do the doing and make it happen and show that it can be done even in every one of our domains that we are responsible for. Thank you. And I don't know if Susan or Wendy, do you have either of you have something to add on that? I, I think um, Christine was, uh, you know, pretty much covered everything, but I, I, I totally agree with um, what she said about in, in, in opening, men can open their eyes and, and, and um, maybe be sensitive and mindful of what's going on around them and maybe some things that maybe they could change. Um, I know even from our experience here in, in the IB uh, that things are changing. I mean, we, we, we sit, we, we're sitting on committees and a, a lot of the committees because we, we have a, maybe more males working in the IB in the International Bureau than, than females. And now there's a new policy that a female has to be on every committee. There has to be a woman's voice on every committee. And, and, and th these things look like they're you know, taken for granted. They should be taken for granted, it should be clear, but it's not because legacy wise, it, it, it just wasn't really thought of. As I said in my opening remarks, that's just the way it was and people didn't question. Now people are questioning and, and people are much more aware. And I, and I think that I can see things changing, you know, not even that slowly. Things are changing quite quickly in the last uh, year or so, at least in my organization. So I, I think that that's, that's really good. Thank you for that, Wendy. Well, uh, another interesting question that's come in in the Q&A section is re with regarding not just involvement of women, but involvement of women who may have intellectual disabilities or physical disabilities um, and, and how they can be involved in the post. Um, now, this, is, this question was specifically about how many are working at UPU headquarters, and I'm not expecting anybody to come up with a statistic off the top of their head. But I, I think it is an interesting, it's a good point, though. How can um, the postal sector make their doors open to employees who are who have a disability, as well as being able to serve customers, whether they're an entrepreneur or an individual who have who who have disabilities. Can, any, can anybody would anybody like to share a quick comment on that? Bearing in mind we only have nine minutes left. I know this is a topic that we could talk about for an hour. Any quick comments on that from anybody? I can give you uh, just a, a quick overview of the, the social services that posts traditionally as well as in the last few years have offered. And for many uh, posts, the vulnerable are customers that they are very mindful of and they have special services, uh, for instance, for the elderly. They will, especially uh, La Poste France is very, very active in this area as well as other posts. Uh, checking in on the elderly, on, on people who are, are vulnerable, not able to leave their homes. These types of, of, uh, of customers with special needs, they, they have a service to, to check in on them. Uh, we have educational programs uh, uh, worldwide through the post and other social programs, um, two various really to mention, but we do have a, a, something called the social services guide um, from the UPU and I'll, I'll put that in the chat. That, that lists the the services that that posts provide and the quite wide variation of services that they already provide and are encouraged to uh, to develop as well. Thank you very much for that, uh, Susan. Um, please, everybody, um, all the participants. You've, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but please do keep chucking your quest, chucking, typing your questions in the Q and A. Uh, we well, I'd love to continue answering as many questions as we possibly can. Rose, I, I want to ask, uh, there's a question I've been holding on to, but I really want to ask you a question. You, you were taught, we were talking about um, role models and peer support and mentoring. 
now that you are establishing yourself as an entrepreneur and an online business, yeah, do you find yourself in that role as a mentor um, and are young women or girls either looking to you or asking you questions about how they can start their own business? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, from what I've been trained and what I've learned and how I've grown, I've been sharing with all the young girls, we call them the girl child, and also the young, uh, uh, the old women that are like talented in their own businesses, but trying to market their business, whatever they are doing. I really uh, say I appreciate and I'm sharing with others and I am encouraging them to also go digital. So I, appreci I really appreciate what this impost has done to me because a lot of, uh, I'll say people around me or people in the area where I'm doing my business, you have seen the, the development from marketing on the digital uh, market. Uh, the, we call it uh, our Zimbabwe uh, email post marketing more. So from there, people have seen the changes and I've shared. To be honest with you, uh, our Zimpost here have really done a lot to me. And now I even have the confidence even talking on the Zoom like what I'm doing right now. Do you know, this is my first time, but if you remember when I started, I could not even speak a continuous sentence, which is something they are really working on. <laughs> well, there we go. I, um, that's that's a great story. Thank you very much uh, for sharing, Rose, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, we really appreciate it. It's always great. I mean, this is a global event, and it's. I think it's very powerful to hear a real life. Well, what what policy is translating into action? Does that make sense, everybody? Anyway, I'm the I'm the lone male voice here. I should probably shut up and get on with the questions, shouldn't I? Yes. Not at all. As we've said repeatedly, we need men to be part of this. Otherwise, it's never going to happen. Only 50% of the population cannot achieve gender equality. Everyone has to be willing to do it. So you are so welcome, Ian, to be here. Well, thank you very much for that, Susan. Um, Will, there's a question that's coming from Britta at um, a Mexican post, Mexico post, Mexico. You know who you are, Britta. Um, as a continuation of this idea of the, the question, really, of how to get people in, especially rural and remote areas or areas where there might be no mobile phone coverage, no internet coverage, how to get them involved. Um, this is not a problem that's limited just to, say, um, a developing nation. It's also an issue in parts of the world where there's just, you know, it's the low population density. I mean, there are parts of Australia where there's no mobile phone coverage or there might not be internet coverage. So the question is, uh, how, if people don't have a signal, don't have internet, what can we do to help solve this situation? Um, Christine, I feel like we've answered the fair part of that already. Is there anything else that you'd like to add on this idea of connectivity, um, on, or, sorry, meaningful connectivity to use your phrase, and how it can be used to help not the disadvantaged or um, help uh, women get connected or even women becoming entrepreneurs? Um, I would say there, I mean, also to, to respond to the question, in many countries, there is what we call a universal service and access fund that really seeks to reach out to those unprofitable areas and there is often a link there to the regulator in those countries those regulators are often the ones re regulating both post and telecom and in the past those funds have been used and they're still i mean they're going through quite a lot of innovation at the moment they were just used for that access piece so if you had kind of coverage in that area it was fine it didn't matter if maybe the school wasn't able to get access to the school so they're going through a transformation now that those uh, public uh, domains like the post office i would imagine as well the health center the school can be connected and through those connected uh, spots in the community the people of the community can access so i would just uh, uh, i would just maybe end on that notion like there are mechanisms in place they're not always implemented but they could be so let's all together make the voices heard of what needs to be done and then see how we can make it happen thank you
Thank you, Christine. Um, really interesting questions coming from Alex, and that picks up on the theme that's come up a few times during this discussion, which is about access to finance. Um, and so it might just be access to banking in some instances where you might have an unbanked population. So one, as Alex's comment is one of the areas where posts can truly help vulnerable women is providing such women with savings accounts, helps keep money safe um, and assists in other areas um, when, it, well, when it comes to things like accessing government services, increasingly governments expect it to have interactions with their government, with their citizens digitally. Does anybody have any comments on things like how posts can provide, help provide access to finance or access to savings accounts and things like that? Any, I mean, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but would anybody love to shove, shove, lift their hand up? Anyone? Wendy, thank you. So yeah, I, to, I financial services are, and the ability to uh, access uh, banking and financial services is, is is really basic to be able to start any business. Um, and in, in rural areas, it is very difficult, not only in rural areas, but in a lot of the developing countries, women especially have problems accessing banking. They, in, in, in fact, in some cases, they need their husband's approval, et cetera. So it's not only the access to the bank, it's actually being able to open a bank account. The, the posts, um, the certain posts in in countries do have the ability to provide financial services. This again is a regulatory issue. Um, the the national the government has to agree to empower the post to to provide financial services. But we've seen that when they do provide financial services through the post, it, it is um, it provides a very easy access and it is taken up and the it helps to grow the economy. So. Yes. I feel like that again is another topic we could talk for an hour on, but we don't have an hour, everybody. We've got probably 30 seconds left. Um, great questions coming about the profitability of posts themselves and their ability to have funds available to invest in these sorts of programs. I think part of the answer to that might be that there is the UPU, what was it called? The development fund? What was it called again? Quality of service fund. <laughs> Quality of service funds, so that could be that could be accessed by by is it by governments or by postal operators themselves, Susan. Or is it not? Uh, it's it's postal operators through uh, the fund uh, call for uh, call for projects. Okay, so if you're interested in that, go to the UPU website or give Susan a ring. She'll tell you all of, <laughs> all about it. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation and. It's not a conversation we should reserve just for one day of the year. It's actually a conversation we should be having throughout the year. Otherwise, we're no better than those people who just post fancy things on LinkedIn once a year about how they support women and then do nothing else for the rest of the year. So I would encourage everybody who's taken part as uh, you know in the webinar, whether you are a panelist, whether you've asked a question, whether you've been listening, um, please get involved somehow and tell the rest of the world, uh, as what somebody said, tell, I think might have been Christine, tell us your wins, right? I could tell you, blokes, men, aren't shy about sharing their wins. There you go, that's a small observation anyway, possibly unwanted and unnecessary. Um, a big thank you to all of our panelists who have shared their expertise. And I wish we could have had longer to get more out of each of you, but I think there's certainly the basis for future conversations. Um, thanks especially to Rose from Zimbabwe for sharing her journey as an entrepreneur. And hopefully it's been inspiring, not just to the people you speak to Rose, but to other people on, who have taken part in this event today, that they will go out into their own communities and find their own roses out there. Um, and as a part of that, that idea of more inclusion of women, not just in the world, but digitally as well. Thank you all to all our panelists again. Thank you to the UPU team for putting this together. Thank you to the translators who have struggled, no doubt, with my impenetrable accent. But thank you again very much for um, making this event accessible as well to people who are French speakers rather than English speakers. Uh, Susan, do you have any final comments before we wrap it up? I have taken frantic notes because there are so many good ideas that came out of this today that we're going to try and put into practice in our sustainability program again. Fantastic. So thank you all for your participation again. Keep the conversation going. Uh, keep the networking going wherever it is that you network. And well, we look forward to bringing another webinar, another UPU webinar to you in the future. 
we always talk about very interesting stuff. So keep your eye out and make sure you subscribe to the UPU mailing list. Go to the UPU website and you'll find a way to subscribe there. So you get a notification every time the UPU runs one of these events. Oh, and remember to subscribe to the UPU voicemail podcast. It's fantastic. and It's hosted by me. And uh, you should definitely listen to that if you didn't get enough of me today or if for some reason your audio didn't work properly and you couldn't hear me for parts of today. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing or hearing from you next time we host a UPU webinar. Thank you, everyone.